All right, joined next here by Joe Scovran. You know him as caddy for Ludwig Oberg, who's uh, obviously going to play his first Masters, going to go into a bunch of majors this year. Uh, places that Joe has has been a part of some high finishes when he was with Ricky Fowler back in 2014. Um, Joe, man, like it, it, it's crazy. Uh, you know, we see each other at different tour events, but man, how's it going? What's, what's been happening? Great. Yeah, just uh, had a couple weeks off and then out here in San Antonio this week and getting ready for the big week next week at Augusta. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine like obviously um, it's the first Masters for your guy. So, man, like knowing what you know about your guy, I know we've talked about some of his strengths in the past, but knowing what you know about your guy's game and knowing what you know about Augusta, I think it's going to be your 12th Augusta, right? Yes, that's correct. So how, how will those marry, those two things marry, his strengths with Augusta, do you think? Yeah, I think the course is a great fit for him. Um, obviously, as a first-timer, it's tough the first time around. Just there's so much experience involved around those greens um, and just being there and the more you've seen it and everything else, and that's why it's been so long since you've seen a first-time winner. Um, but if there's a guy that's got a chance to do it, it's definitely him because – the golf course fits him really well. Um, you know, his attitude will be great out there. Patience, um, kind of picking his spots, not getting rattled. Um, a lot of those things will come into play. And then we've tried to do all the prep we could. Went out there for a couple of days um, after players. Went and got some prep in so we wouldn't have to do as much um, during the tournament week. And then we've got a plan for our prep that I think we're pretty happy with. And we'll see where it goes. Yeah. Well, I like how you said that he's very patient. And um, I know the word you used when we talked to Bay Hill, you said he's just unflappable, like mistakes mm -hmm. don't get to him. Like what, where do you think that comes from? Why do you think he's able to, you know, have that mentality? Yeah, I think his natural demeanor is a little bit that way. And then I think he's worked on it as well. Um, so, you know, there's some work that goes into that and, you know, you kind of decide to have that attitude as well. Right. And today was a perfect example he made a couple of bogeys early. The golf course was playing tough. We were two over for the tournament. It looked like somewhere <laughs> around even was going to be the cut. And, you know, he went and shot three under on the back nine, made the cut, you know, just kind of kept, kept doing his thing, kept playing golf. Yeah. Well, I know that you also have talked about him. Like he's so good at like not having too active of a mind, right. You mm -hmm. know, we'll go up and uh, Andy North said on a conference call this week, man, he just goes up and he just hits shots. Like, yeah. He pulling the string on the shot, the tee shot on seven at Pebble. Remember, uh, you guys had the discussion, yeah. and then it was on, it yeah. on PGA Tour. Like, what the heck, man? He, he's just so quick to it. What do you think it is about his mentality? He's able to be so decisive, you know? Yeah, I mean, since I've been working for him, that's how he is, right? And if anything, you're trying to slow him down a little bit. Um, and we just try to get through the whole process of going through everything there is and then coming up with something simple to do at the end, right? So you go through all these things to get to a simple shot that you're going to hit, right? But sometimes you have to factor in all these different things to come up with what that right shot is. And then we just try to focus on, all right, just go hit that shot now. And he's just naturally kind of a quicker player. Um, you know, I don't think he's, he's able to kind of give up control of, the outcome a little bit which I think that's hard to do as a golfer and that's going to allow you to pull the trigger quicker when you can just say hey, okay this is my decision this is what I'm going to do I'm going to go do it and I'm going to deal with the results afterwards hmm. and what do you think that is about that? he's 24 like giving up control of outcome like that's not easier said than done you know what I mean like yeah um is it is it like a it's an attitude adjustment or just acceptance or like how, how would you define I think it? it's all the above you know I think he's naturally got a little bit of that he's worked on it um he's got good perspective he's got a lot of maturity and I just think all those things add up to he has that kind of a demeanor and that doesn't mean that he doesn't get bothered or frustrated or anything else but he's so good at kind of bringing himself back and realizing that's how he's going to play his best golf that uh, he does it and, you know, enjoys himself out there and um, just kind of has a great attitude towards golf. Right. 
when you talk about enjoying enjoying himself, it's interesting. Like you, you talked to um, Claude Harmon on his podcast, and you've had some really good in depth conversations about like catting. What makes a really good caddy? And I know the way you've had to present information has been different to to each player, like with any caddy, right? And um, you know, I, you know, Tom Kim, it was a lot. He, he'd be a lot more chatty, right? And Mm -hmm. You'd have to kind of just play to that and figure read read the situation. So so for for Ludwig, how do you how do you kind of figure out where you intersperse your comments and where you bring your your insight? Yeah, the first couple of weeks, I kind of I only kind of spoke when he was asking questions. Um, you know, I'd give him the basics. We kind of talked about what we were going to do um, early that week, the first week I was working for him, and then we'd kind of sit down after every round. Hey, what'd you like about it? What did you not? How was the communication? And we did that a lot the first couple of weeks. And we still kind of check in on it after rounds, kind of have a little debrief, just, you know, what could have been better? What wasn't, you know, what was good? Did we do everything right? Did we talk through things the right way? Did I see anything? Did he see anything? And, um, you know, it's so there's more talking than there was at the start now. Um, but like I said, we always come back to something simple at the end, right? So when you get to these tougher golf courses and wind swirling and the landing spots are more, you know, more important that, it, that they're tighter and mistakes are, you know, more penal, then you have to go through some of these things. But it, at the end right. of the day, it's, am I hitting a stock eight iron? Am I hitting a cut seven iron? What shot am I hitting? And I just have to go hit that shot. So... Yeah. And, and not, not overthink it, I guess, huh? Yeah, exactly. What's interesting. Um, I asked him at Bay Hill about you. I said, what is it that Joe brings to the table? Right. And he, obviously he said experience, you know, the course as well, Mo the Monday through Wednesday, when you guys show up to these new courses, that's huge. Just picking your brain and, and, and talking about, that. he also said though, that you bring a sense of calm. Uh, which I thought was really unique. And, and, and you know, what, what would be your you know response to that when you, when you hear that? Uh, that I like when I hear that because that's <laughs> what I try to do, right? Like, I think that's very important. I think whether you're a coach or a caddy or anything there, like, I think the players can feel your energy. And so if, if they feel like you're rattled or nervous or, worried or unhappy or any of those things that can affect them especially with golf right there's just so much time in between shots there's so many things going on and so that's what I try to do I try to just you know obviously I care and obviously I'm into it and my mind's going you know trying to go through everything that's going on but at the end of the day it's hey let's just go hit another shot let's go react the same way and let's keep doing this over and over and over right and that's basically what I try to do out there. So that's nice to hear him say that. Yeah. And, and even I, I know in the past, um, you know, you've talked about Sunday pressure contention. You know, we had an interview with Caddy Network. Um, you said that that's what you relish. That's one of the things you really relish about yeah. Caddy. Give me a sense of, on Sundays, like what kinds of things you do to be ready. Mark Urbanic told me that, man, he, he's focusing on his breathing, slowing down his breathing. He's preparing himself so that everything he says uh, oozes confidence. Like it oozes, the, there's no, no doubt, no question. But he's thinking about that Sunday morning so that he's ready for Tony, uh, you know what I mean? Sunday afternoon. So, so for you, like what, what kinds of things do you do to get ready for what you relish that, that Sunday pressure? Yeah, for me, it's more just being prepared with the golf course, knowing that I've kind of got everything under control of how it's going to be playing, what kind of shots we need to hit, what the strategy is going to be. Are we ready for all the different scenarios? Is he, and then the biggest thing is, is he ready for all the scenarios and bring those up of what things could happen? And, you know, little things on a Sunday might be, you know, like Charlotte, for example, if you're in contention in Charlotte, there's the drivable hall in the back nine, 14. And, yeah. So like a couple of times with Ricky, I, when we were in contention, I would go through it with him of, okay, one shot lead. Are we going for the green? Yeah, we're going for the green. Uh, two shot lead, are we going for the green? No, we're laying back. Okay. Um, two shots back, what are we doing? Three shots back, what are we doing? And then hold them to it so that we're not making a decision on the fly that we regret later, right? So it's, right. let's go through these scenarios that could happen today, 
right? Like if this is the case, then we've already made this decision. It's pre-planned. We know this is the way to go. And obviously you're going to have to make adjustments at times, but I'll try to go through those scenarios, try to make sure they're ready for the scenarios. Um, and then other than that, I just, I like it. I have fun with it. So um, I just try to do the best I can do in those situations and provide my guy with what he needs and then go enjoy it. Yeah. But you've also said that it's, it's a thrill when, when your guy's asking for confirmation on something or, or when you, when you say um, give your input and then it works out, you know what yes. I mean? Like that, that really embold, emboldens you like, you know, how else would you explain it? Yeah. I mean, that's exactly right. Like that's, there's nothing that feels better in caddying if, you know, you give an opinion that works out in a big situation, right? Because that's our job. We're supposed to be there helping them. And the worst feeling in caddying is if you spoke up, gave an opinion and that shot doesn't work out. Right. So um, yeah, it, that's what you want to happen. You want that to be the case and you want to come to the decisions together, right? Like it shouldn't matter who comes up with the idea, whether they were on eight and you were on seven or the other way around, as long as you get to the right answer, that's all that matters. You know, just like reading greens, they might see inside, right. And you might see outside, right. Well, if edge is the answer, then you guys did your job coming up with that together. Right. So you're just trying to solve the puzzle together and that's, it doesn't matter who comes up with it. I mean, for example, you know, when Rick won the players, I wanted him to lay up on 16, you know, the shot, just everything we've gone through everything. And it yeah. was a big, it was a big cut and long left is dead water right and it's just what didn't fit the number didn't fit anything and i was pushing laying up and he's like i'm hitting the shot you know and it worked out and turned out and it's the biggest win of his career at this point right so you just don't know how it's all going to work out all the time you just try to give the best information you can and the best opinion you can at the time for what you know at that time right and go through all the scenarios mm -hmm. You also just said inside right. Is it this? Is it that? Talking about a little, little bit on the greens with Ludwig right now. How often does he call you in and, and with with green reading and kind of what's you know what's typically the the conversation like? Yeah, it's a little different week to week. Most of the time, he doesn't call me in a whole lot. He usually, call me in a couple putts around. You know, this week he's been calling me in a little bit more. I think next week he'll probably call me in a little bit more. Uh, we had one round in LA where he called me in the whole Sunday. Um, but then there's other times where it might be once in a round, you know, and he's just kind of doing his thing. So it, I think it just depends on how he's seeing the greens and what's going on. And um, I think most players are that way, but then there's other ones that, you know, they want the caddy to read every putt with them. Right. And you're in there every time um, doing that. So I like our balance. Uh, if he's seeing the greens, let him, let him keep going. If he's struggling a little bit and, he wants to get the second set of eyes on it, then great. I'm there for him. Hmm. Well, I know you mentioned that you guys went there for a practice round right after TPC, right? A couple, couple practice mm -hmm. rounds. Yes. Any, anything, uh, you know, memorable happened with, with the way he played? Like, did he, did he have a, you know, a, a big, a big streak of scoring? I know the wind was a little funky, but you know, any, any uh, holes come to mind that were, Hey, that, that was, that was pretty cool. That he pulled that off. No, there was nothing crazy. Um, it was very interesting for me to see a guy with that much speed, how much Augusta changes and some of the spots he could hit it in um, and what he can do to some of those holes. So that was cool to see um, just some of the spots we're going to be playing from and to see whether it's this year or in the future, how well that place is going to fit him um, because of what he can do off the tee. Uh, I think it's a big advantage him there of the spots he can hit it in um and how many times he's able to hit driver around that golf course doesn't really take driver out of his hands much really which is really nice yeah just because the tr there's not a ton of trouble off the tee or or white yeah and then just you know some golf courses you kind of run out of room and get to a narrow area or there's big time trouble down there where you're hitting driver but um we're going to be hitting a lot of drivers um and so which i like that for him because the driver's his weapon so what what particular area or areas stick out from where you guys ended up? You're like, hey, this this is awesome that he could get there. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty cold when we were there. And, you know, he hit it past the bunker on number two, you know, kind of partway down the hill. 
And you see that more in the tournament when it's warmer and it's firmer. But you know, fairways were decently soft and it was, you know, 55 ish degrees when we got to that <laughs> hole. Um, and so him hitting it down there and then just how far he can push it up there on three. You know, if we get the right wind, he can get really close to that green, um, which is nice. Um, yeah, it's a tough pitch from down there, but just in a statistic, statistics based golf world now, that's the play for a long hitter to hit it down there. And then, you know, if you've got a funky shot, just play safely, kind of like you do on number 10 at Riv. If you get out of position, go be smart about it. But just not having to hit that wedge shot, especially on a windy day and judging that wind and everything else, you know, getting to hit a pitch in there is pretty nice. And then just some of the clubs you'll have in the par fives, you know, like any of the long hitters there, that's a big advantage, you know, on 13 and 15 and then eight. You know, if you can get an iron into eight, that's a big deal. An iron or a seven wood, you know, rather than coming in there with a three wood or not able to get home. So those will all be, that'll be really nice to kind of have that length um, that gives you an advantage on that golf course. And it seems like he's he's going to be able to, he's got the distance to have a, an iron into eight, it seems. Yeah, if he gets the right win, he gets a little help or something, he'll he'll get some irons in there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Hunter Stewart, I know he's a, he's a big help, but his yeah. statistician, okay, if I can talk here, yeah. um, and you oftentimes will look at the game plan that, that Hunter has, and then you'll be yeah. able to, to speak to him, right? And say, hey, Hunter thinks yeah. this, cover this bunker. I, th I think that as well. Well, what do yeah. you think, right? Like, how, how is that dialogue like? Yeah, so Hunter usually sends me the stuff before the week. I go through it. Um, I go through my past notes. I go see what he's got. Maybe he's got something that I don't have that's, you know, of statistic relevance that, you know, is a different way to look at the whole. Um, and so I'll go back and forth with him with some questions, things like that. And then we kind of go from there and just go play. And, but bottom line is even if the stats say something, if the player doesn't want to play the hole that way, then you don't play the hole that way. Right. But if there's something that's a 50, 50, Hey, you know, miss right, miss left here. And it's not an obvious miss. Maybe the stats will show, Hey, but this wind direction, you know, getting up and down to this bunker, statistically more guys are doing it. So you kind of lean that way. Some things like that um, really come in. They, I mean, golf, that's become a big part of golf. And it's kind of changed the way guys play. It's gotten them more aggressive off the tee, you know, more value on pushing up by greens, yeah. um, getting closer to the hole, you know, rather than, you know, it used to be lay up to your number, you know, and hey, you know, hit three wood in the fairway, you know, rather than pushing the driver up there. And there's a lot more now, Hey, wedge from the rough, you know, this week is, uh, and on this hole is better than three wood from the fairway back there. Um, so, you know, there's kind of a blend um, as a caddy, you try to blend all that, right. Your, your guy's personality, what you think, what the stats say situation. And that's kind of the fun part about it is trying to blend all that together. Well, you said that uh, oftentimes, like even if the stats say it, you know, maybe your guy's not feeling comfortable with driver. You can just tell what what kinds of things do you see in the nonverbal? I mean, you're you're a caddy, you read people all the time, but what kinds of nonverbal or verbal things do you pick up from Ludwig when he doesn't want to uh, go after a certain club? You know what I mean? Like like yeah. how do you what, what do you pick up? So that's the great thing about Lud is when we we do a pre free round um, kind of talk over the pins what we're going to do off the tee all that stuff just to kind of be ready for all of it um, which that was his idea to do that and I thought it was a great idea and I think it's a very professional mature kind of thing to be doing this early in your career and I just think it takes out a lot of question marks and the good thing about him is he'll vocalize it he'll say hey you know I don't know about driver there today, you know, and it's like, we'll go yeah. through it and talk about it and he'll bring it up and then we'll come up with the answer to it. Um, and then, you know, when you're, you can kind of just feel guys' personalities, right. When you're talking about a shot and you're like, you can tell if they're iffy on a club or if they love a club and, you know, and you can kind of work off that. Right. And so you just pick up, there's not anything that is like a cue to me. That's like a, for sure with him. It's just, I can just kind of tell, okay, he's not sure about this. Okay, let's talk about it a little bit more and see which one he really likes. Because there's a lot of shots out here that it can be a hard 
seven iron that's drawing or it can be a chippy hold six iron right it's just which shot do you like more right and we had one today that you know the chippy seven wood was the perfect club right to get to where we needed to get but you know the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour you know in off the left and that seven wood getting up in the air all of a sudden brings sideways into play and even though it's the perfect club it's like let's go ahead and roast the four iron because you know it's taking a lot of things out of the equation and it didn't quite get to the green but it didn't put us in a bad spot you know on a par five and we were in a good area and it kind of took the wild miss out right so mm. there's just things like that that you know we went back and forth for a little while and it was like okay let's just do this this is the simpler way to do it so um you just try to pick up on that and you learn more every day about a guy when you're when you're with them and then you learn more about them in pressure situations what they like what they don't like and you just try to observe and kind of learn from any mistakes you make and just keep getting better yeah and he seems to thrive under pressure man i, I yeah what do you attribute that to i don't know you know i i i don't know i he seems to just like it to me you know I mean, but you know i saw it my second week working for him you know he's playing sony and through seven holes the second day he's kind of i think he was like one outside the cut line maybe two somewhere in there and just kind of turned on the jets and got into that mode and played great golf the rest of the way and you know it didn't bother him same thing today um and i saw the same thing down the stretch even though it didn't work out at tory i could tell he liked it and he relished it and he wanted it and he tried all the shots that were going to give us a chance to win and they didn't all work out that day but he was playing to go get the win and get that golf tournament and go post a number. He wasn't planning to just, well, let me just kind of get around here and see if it works out. He was taking on the shots. And then Pebble, you know, we knew playing that third round, we had talked about it before. This might be the last round. So right. we want to end the day. We're not going to force things, but we want to end the day in the lead because this thing could get called. And Wyndham had posted that number and we weren't going to force it because there still was – possibly a fourth day but we were definitely trying to get to that number and um you know you didn't see him back down you didn't see him make a lot of mistakes um you know playing with the number one player in the world went and shot a really good round of golf it's just Wyndham just played an amazing round of golf you know out there and passed us so yeah well and one of his big strengths you've told me in the past and you've said to Claude Harmon and many others the ability to hit the long irons really high and, and you've, yeah. you've been very complimentary of Scotty Scheffler, some of the greats, uh, Tiger, Rory. That's what they're able to do. What, in your in your observation, his technique, what is it that allows him to do that so well that you've noticed? Well, he generates speed. You know, I think his golf swing, um, just the way it's built, you know, he just launches it high. And, you know, you'll see, not that he's a really upright swinger, but, you know, a lot of the upright swingers, you know, Chamblee's talks about that a lot. They produce a high ball flight. A lot of times they're good from the rough. Um, you'll see a lot of that. Um, you know, and like I said, the the greats that you've seen, that's what they do, right? Jack did it. Tiger did it. Rory does it. Scheffler does it. You know, you go down that list, it's just a big advantage because pins can't hide from you. When the, when the greens get firm, pins don't hide from these guys. Other guys they can't get to some of those pins. And so just being able to do that, I think that that's the thing that people don't talk about enough in golf. They always talk about ball speed and how far a guy hits it. Well, if a guy hits it flat far, that's totally different than hitting it high and far. High and far, now you carry bunkers. You can take it over trees off the tee. You can stop it on greens, you know, all those kind of things. And that's the big advantage of speed to me on the PGA Tour. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge, man. Um, and, and you get to a place like Augusta, you know it so well. I mean, there's some great memories in the 11 years you, you caddied there, uh, Joe. What's the hardest hole to caddy at Augusta? 12. Really? 12, absolutely. 12, you're just, <laughs> okay. the wind swirls so much. And, you know, it's not it's not set up for a right-handed player, right? It's, it's such a genius design with that. For a lefty, it's a lot easier because – the lefty, a pull's going further. Well, that's covering the water on the right, right? The trouble's short right to those right pins. And, you know, a miss for a lefty is going is going shorter to the left. 
Well, that's where you run out of room long is on the left side. Mm. For a righty, the pole's getting long and left, which there's some trouble up there. And it's not great. <laughs> Say and that again. Hit, and the miss hit is short right, which is straight in the water. And that's why you've seen so many disasters there, right? And as soon as you make an uncommitted swing there, you know, and when that wind's swirling, sometimes it's hard to commit and it's hard to, you know, or if you're taking something off. And as soon as you kind of don't, that water just gobbles it up. And so you're always kind of sigh relief when that ball hits the green. Green or fringe, you're fine with it. And, okay, let's move on. Let's get our three and get out of here. Yeah. No, but knowing your guy and, and knowing um, that course for 12, I mean, it's just a matter of – reading the situation and knowing the swirling winds are there and can exist. Yeah. But I mean, you know, how, how will you approach that next week? Yeah. To me, it'll be just trying to get him as committed as possible to whatever we're doing and taking a conservative line to those right pins. That's the biggest thing. Can't try to stuff it in there to those right pins. Like you hit it in between those back bunkers, you take the 20 feet, you move on. It's an accident if you hit it closer than that. And, and then just trying to get him committed to whatever club that is um, and hit a solid shot. Mm. And you shouldn't be too far off if you do that. Yeah. I know John Wood has told me that at 15, there's nothing like waiting in that fairway as your second shot is floating in the air for that long, man. Like it's can feel yeah. like an eternity. How, you know, how, how are you, how does it feel to you at caddy in that hole and, and with Ludwig, you know, with his distance, is that going to be a big help? Yeah. I mean, 15, when that green gets firm and that backside gets firm and the bounces get big, then, you know, 15, you know, there's a lot of precision involved there. The thing about 15, though, is if you lay up, that wedge shot when the greens are firm is pretty hard, too. So, um, you know, off side hill lie, you know, getting a bounce and, you know, hitting that little delicate shot. So um, the great thing with him, I mean, he's got the seven wood in the bag, but he launches straight in the air and yeah, right. know, launches launches the long iron so far that as long as it's a solidly hit shot for him then if it gets in any trouble with a solidly hit shot there with a guy bringing it in that high then we did something wrong so um yeah I, there i mean that's a big advantage on that hole the way he the, the guys that hit it high with their long irons and their fairway woods it's a big advantage on that hole what's his stock uh carry on on the seven wood and, and on the driver so the seven wood is 230 meters, which is roughly 253 yards, right? Um, and then the driver is 285 meters. So I think in meters now. So uh, <laughs> hey, yeah, the, the European. Yeah, 310, 315 in the air. So that's pretty stock for him. And, and that's carry, man. That's that's yeah. pretty, that's a weapon, it man. It carries it a long ways. Yeah, he launches it pretty high and um you know he'd be on the higher end to spin so yeah. hell of a weapon to have at the majors yeah. you know what i mean yeah definitely, definitely. And, and speaking of the majors valhalla is the next one i mean you were right we went with ricky it was between ricky phil and and rory and and you kind of tasted that course i know they made some little changes changed the tee box on 18 uh i think 12 they had a different kind of green look with the kind of like the the water around it um how what kinds of little things can you do to help him at Valhalla if I know yeah, it's been 10 Valhalla, years once, yeah once we get there I mean I felt like Valhalla you know like a lot of the PGA championships there's not as much to figure out usually because they do such a good job of setting it up fair and it's more like a premier PGA tour event rather than you know like a major um with this course set up and I think they do a good job of identifying the best player that week. They don't try to trick it up. They don't try to throw any curveballs at you and Valhalla from what I remember, you know, it's a big course, some room off the tee, big greens. Um, so I don't think there'll be a whole lot of insight. It'll just be us getting our game plan, going and playing golf. Um, you know, I've been there once and it was 10 <laughs> years ago. So That's what I, mean. I, I do have good vibes there, obviously, you know, because Rick played well there. Um, so that's nice. But as far as like insight, I, I don't think I'll have that much insight to give him. That's going to be that valuable, you know? Hmm. 
would you say that you know Pinehurst? It's been the same amount of time. I mean, have you have you been back there since, or or do you think there's any little nuances of Pinehurst that could help? Or no, I haven't. But I, I think knowing how to play Pinehurst, yeah, is going to be an advantage. Knowing what the USGA might do with it, you know, with pins, things like that, um, especially there. You know, the fact that we've been there, kind of knew what the pins were. I kind of already know the leaves to those pins, things like that. Um, having seen some of those shots around the greens and how they can get uh, Pinehurst, it's just going to be about hitting the fairway, try to hit as many greens as possible, just hit it in the middle of the green, don't mess with anything. And then, you know, if you get out of position, just get out of there with par bogey. Right. Um, man, I, I think about you going to Augusta here uh, and obviously like all the memories, but what would you tell fans? What would you tell first time patrons that show up that have always wanted to go to Augusta? What are the things they spots they really have to get to? You got to get down to 12, right? You got to, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think walking down the fairway after you hit the second shot on 11 and looking at 11 and 12, I think it's the coolest spot in all of golf. Um, you know, I guess 18 at St. Andrews would be up there as well. But for me, the Masters has always been my number one. I just think that's the most special place you can be, um, that part of the golf course. And I just think for fans, you got to go down there and see that. Uh, I think 16 is a fun hole to watch. If you're going to sit on a hole, you know, especially yeah. on Sunday with that pin, you know, you might see a one. You're going to see all these exciting shots. Um, I wouldn't go to 16 when the pin's back, right? Because you're not going to see a lot of birdies. So um, I would stay away from it that day. But, uh, <laughs> I got you. You know, and then just, I think, you know, if you're a first timer, it shocks you how high up you are on one tee and how far down there 12 green is. And I think that's so cool just seeing the actual elevation that you can't get a feel for on TV and seeing the slopes and the greens, you know, go walk over to five and look at how big that slope is on that green, you know, five and six. I don't know if TV does it justice, how big those slopes are, you know, some things like that. Um, and then, you know, go get yourself, you know, a mento cheese sandwich. And, you know, I'm not a big fan of them, but, you know, I guess you got to have one. Well, so, why not? Oh, Joe, come on. I don't know. I just, it's part of the experience. I like, the other, I like the other sandwiches. I'm a master's club guy. So uh, actually, Austin Johnson showed me a trick. Uh, DJ's brother showed me a trick a few years ago that I use all the time. You get the egg salad sandwich. You take the egg salad <laughs> off the sandwich and you put it on the master's club and it's amazing. Oh, so there's man. a tip for people. Yeah. Just because it's got the best of both worlds or what? Yeah. Cause you don't really want to eat the white bread, right? Like, you know, whatever. Throw away. But the egg salad is, I'm a big egg salad fan. It's really good. You put it on the master's club. The master's club's on the little bun. You got everything you need right there. It's great. Love that. Love that. Hey, Paul Tesori asked me to ask you this. Who is the unicorn? <laughs> so the original the original unicorn is webb simpson but oh. uh i've been telling people i think lud's a little bit of a unicorn himself so um yeah but the original unicorn is webb simpson huh now why why is lud the uh the unicorn now well he's just a unique combination <laughs> of that good of a golfer that good of a guy that nice of a guy that easy to be around um yeah, you just don't see that combo a whole lot. Um, you know, so easy going, you know, the whole thing. So I don't know if Paul told you the story behind why Webb was the unicorn, but um, oh. you know, Webb Simpson's about as good as it gets. So well, what what was that story real quick? He's the only player I've ever heard of that gave his caddy a pep talk during a round. Oh, so boy. Uh, <laughs> as soon as I heard that story, I said, you know what, Paul, he's a unicorn. So Love it. Joe, there's so many shared passions we have. Uh, we get into so much. I mean, I know Scotland, you know, you, you actually told me to play North Berwick, remember, in the 2015 Open. Yeah. Um, I was talking about places I wanted to play after that. You said, dude, you have to go there. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Believe me. And, and I did. And it's my favorite spot ever. My, my favorite spot in golf. Um, but we'll have to get into that for another podcast one of these days. I, I know it's something that you love. You love playing Lynx golf. You bring your clubs every time, right? I used to. I haven't the last couple of years, but I used to do it all the time, and I do love Lynx Golf. It's fun. Yeah, buddy. Well, hey, really appreciate it, man, and, and we'll catch up again soon. Thanks so much, Joe. Of course. Thanks for having me.